Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio from Boise, Idaho. This is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net, and uh, follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Before we do get started, I want to uh, remind you that we have some great audio uh, book productions available for you at audible.com, as well as in the iTunes stores. My audio books, All I Needed to Know, I Learned from Columbo, as well as Tales of the Dim Night, Fly Another Day, and Powerhouse Hard Pressed are all available. So you can have some great uh, listening pleasure. Just remember to check out my audio books at Audible or in the iTunes store. Also this weekend, I have a radio drama review at greatdetectives.net. We're taking a look at Tarzan and the Fires of Tor, a 1936 radio serial. And uh, my whole uh, review that is there at greatdetectives.net. And you can also subscribe to it if you have a Kindle in the iTunes store. I mean, not the iTunes, but the Kindle store. Well, here now is the Matthews Murray... Mishmoss case. Ladies and gentlemen, we take you now by transcription behind the scenes of a police headquarters in a great American city, where under the cold, glaring lights will pass before us the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. This is the lineup. <laughs> Hello, Miss Connolly. Mm-hmm. Sorry I'm late. Oh, that's perfectly all right. I just hope that I can do some help. Uh, how's Mr. Matthews? We had him over for dinner this evening. It was an just beside himself. You just can't understand that he's disappearing like this. Do you think something terrible has happened to us? We never know. Oh, dear. Do you think the salesman might have had something to do with it? Mm, there's always the possibility. Everybody we've talked to seems to be clear. Cleaning lady, Miss Murray, says she took Mrs. Matthews downtown at 9.30... You saw them leave. I waved to Betty. They backed out of the driveway. Maybe Betty had amnesia or something. She wouldn't leave like this without a note. Well, the hospitals are being checked. The only thing we can do is follow every possible lead. And that's got a seat on somewhere. Over there, okay? Yeah, sure. Here, here, Mr. Hello. You know the game, Sunday? Uh, yeah, I suppose. The brand's really improved. It's, uh... Do police and football fans? Sure, we go whenever we can. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire in the audience room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the line, please. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call off a number they may be charged. Do you have any questions for identification? Oh, Pete, let's see. I wish I'd have been. If you're sure or not too sure of the suspect, cut in hell. The questions I ask these suspects today is that a nice control of voice. I do not pay too much attention to their answers as they often are. <laughs> All right, bring on the lights. Okay, keep it moving over here to the end of the stage, boy. Number two, come on, pick it up. Oh, must be hurt, never mind. Turn face front. Hands at your sides and look straight ahead, straight out through the screen. Deal number two, stand up straight. What's picking on me for? I'm not picking on you. You told you. Yes. When I call out your number, step out. Keep facing the screen and talk up so everybody can hear you. I want all the people out there to get a good look at you and be able to hear what you say. So stand up and talk up. All right, number one, Clyde McDonald, Grand Theft Auto. Where do you live, Clyde? Lieutenant, that's the third one. Where? He looks like the man. The only thing is his hair wasn't that short if it's the same man. Well, you'll get a better look at him in a minute. Oh, Solid City. Working here in town? Oh, I can't say the fight in the hair I like. Where'd you get the car you were picked up in? 
Find a mile on the junk. Uh, you know what the stone car? No, I don't know what stone is. Did I go for a ride in a hot car? You did. Where's your friend that let you to die? Well, I told you, I guess. You've been out there, haven't you? You were out there. Someone's living there or has lived there, but I mean, he lives. That's funny. All I know is what I told you. That's where you told me you live. I only met him yesterday. Where did you meet this friend of yours? Far over on 36th Street. And we were supposed to give the car back to him? Not that in particular. He said he'd look me up when he needed it. And I guess you boys don't believe me. That sounds kind of crazy, don't it? Sure does. Okay, Clyde, step back. Well, I'm telling the truth. You fellas better do some more checking out. We will. Step back. Number two, Elroy Park, disturbing the peace. Okay, Elroy, step up. Where do you live, Elroy? No place, pleasure. When I ask where you live, I want to know where you slept last. Oh. Well, where do you live? Hotel down on South First Street. Nice place. Everything's real handy. How long have you been in town, Elroy? Two days. Where are you from? Arizona. A little town named McNair. Got a job? No. I'm kind of taking a What kind of work do you do? Farm work. Irrigating and stuff like that. How tall are you, Elroy? Six foot four. Right. Sure enough. Where's your family? Down in Arizona, I reckon. That's where they were when I last saw them. How old are you? Thirty-three, I think. Don't you know? No. Nope. I've never been much to mess around with details like that. You die when you get old, even if you don't know how old you are. What happened last night? Nothing much. I don't know why everybody gets so upset over a little fight. You sure made a mess out of that bar. But you're right. I had some help, though. How's that? Well, the guys I was fighting broke up some of the stuff. One man didn't do that much to me. How'd it start? I just took off town kind of natural life. Well, down there and I started to feel pretty good, so I declared myself. Three or four guys took me on. I figured I had them with last time you guys got there. Well, you always take care of yourself, all right? Shucks. Well, nothing personal about it. I'm just feeling good. Your feet still hurt? I hope you shot. It's killing me. Okay, I'll always right, step back. Number three, Edward King, open shot. I'm pretty sure it's him. It's him. It looks like he's just going to have to. That's what it is, I'm sure. But that's the man, Miss Innes. He's the one that was around the day Betty disappeared. Miss Sergeant Carger. Yes, Lieutenant. Hold number three for interrogation. You work around Bellwood yesterday, King? Sure. Hey, what's this all about? You in the 500 block of Upton Road? 500 block? Yeah, I sold some cards to a Mrs. Roberts. Well, what's going on here anyway? I haven't done anything. I got a license to sell in this place. Don't you read the papers? Not today, I haven't. Did you just get your hair cut? Yeah, about four this afternoon. Is it against the law to get your hair cut? No. You had quite a bit of money on you when you were picked up, didn't you? A little over $200. Where'd you get it? I just got a commission check this morning. Where'd you cash it? First Security and Trust, 5th and Logan. You can check with him. We will. You think I stole the money? Did you call on a Mrs. Matthews on Upton Road yesterday? Yeah, I don't know. I may have. I only find out the names of the ones that buy from me. She lived in a two-story brick house, 500 block. Has a white picket fence around the front yard. I think so. Oh, is there one of those little statues like they used to tie horses to on the front lawn? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was there. What time was that? About nine, I guess. Did you talk to Mrs. Matthews? I don't know. I guess so. She said she was a lady of the house. Did she seem upset? Nervous? No. No, she was real nice. Said she was in a hurry. Was going downtown. She wanted me to come back later. She said she hadn't bought her cards yet. What's the matter? Something happened to this Mrs. Matthews? She's been missing since yesterday. Maybe she went for a trip or something. My gosh, you think I got something to do with her being missing? I'm just checking. Believe me, Lieutenant, I haven't done anything. You'd better stay around town... Well, we can get hold of you. Sure, I will. I got nothing to run away for. Well, the papers are still giving White a rough time for fading back that 50 yards in the first Bears game. <laughs> Poor guy. He thought sure he could break the way. Uh, remember when that guy ran the wrong way in the Rose Bowl game? Uh-huh. Uh, he sure took a ribbing. 
What was his name? Uh, I used to know. Uh, what was it? I'm trying to think of it all day. Mm. Nice district. Yeah. Oh, Nelson called. Looks like Edward King is in the clear. The company works for gave him a clean bill. And they'd already sent him a commission check for $175. Hmm. I think I'll start in selling Christmas cards. Maybe that's the way out for Ash or something. Oh, Lieutenant Justice. Hello, Miss Murray. Are you a member Sergeant Cargo? Yes. Is uh, Mr. Matthews home? He's in the den. He's been in there all morning. Who is it, Lieutenant Guthrie and Sergeant Cargo. They won't see you. Oh, good. Bring them back. This one. Hello, Lieutenant. Sergeant. Sergeant. Matthews. I was just getting ready to call you. Any news? Uh, nothing yet, Mr. Matthews. We, um, want to ask you some more questions, if you don't mind. Oh? Sit down, gentlemen. Thank you. It won't take long, Mr. Matthews. We'd just like to go over some things with you. All right, Mr. Matthews. Were you and your wife happily married, Mr. Matthews? Okay. Did you have any serious differences? Well, no, nothing that you could call serious but... The only disagreement we ever had was over our son, Charles. Betty would have spoiled him rotten if I hadn't put my head down. Now, how old is Charles? Well, let's see, he's 33. He lives over on the other side of town. Betty was always of the mind that we had plenty, so why shouldn't we buy things for Charles now, while we were alive? We could see him in Jordan. She always said he would get everything when he was gone anyway. Was your wife ever despondent? Well, no, she had no reason to be. We live comfortably. She keeps busy with her club work, and we usually get along together. She has no enemies that you know of? Oh, no, none. How long has Miss Murray worked for you? Over four years. I guess it's nearly five. She comes and cleans three days a week. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. She fixes dinner for us on those nights. She and Mrs. Matthews get along? As far as I know, they do. You left the house about seven o'clock Monday morning? That's right. Your wife seemed to be in good spirits? Mm Mm-hmm. She's going downtown. If I'd been going to the office, I'd have taken her as I went in, but I had to go over to Longview. Betty said that she would have the housekeeper, Miss Murray, drive her down. And then she'd come on over to the office and ride home with me that night. And so I waited until nearly oh, 8 o'clock that evening at the office, and... Well, you know the rest. Do you know if she had much money with her? As a matter of fact, quite a bit. She was going to buy a dress, and Charles' wedding anniversary is next week, so she was going to get something for them. Mm-hmm. Do you have a gun in the house? Why, yes, I do. It's uh, one Charles brought back from overseas. It's a Luger. Uh, he gave it to me. <laughs> I don't know why I took it. I've always hated guns. I wrapped it in a cloth and put it away in the bottom desk drawer. Did your wife know where it was? Mm-hmm. She took it after me to give it back to Charles. She didn't like a gun in the house either. Yes, you still have it? Mm-hmm. I guess so. <laughs> Just a second. I know it's gone. This is where I put it, but it's not here. The lineup will not be heard next week, but returns to the air on Friday, December 12th. Consult your papers on Friday, December 12th for the new time of The Lineup. Starting this Friday night, listen for yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring John Lund as the insurance sleuth with the action-packed expense account, long known to CBS Radio Mystery Fans. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, begins a new series of adventures on most of these same stations this Friday night. You'll enjoy hearing John Lund as the colorful traveling detective who accepts freelance murder and fraud investigations and sums them up on his swindle sheet each week. Remember, yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is back again. Friday nights at the Star's Address. Don't miss him. More coffee, then? No, thanks. Quine back? No, I don't think so. You know, Pete... A woman that's afraid of a gun doesn't take one and then go out and get herself lost. Matthews may be lying. No, I don't think so. The cleaning lady? No, no. I doubt it. Hi, Beth. Pete. Hi. Hi, Quine. 
You get out to check on Mr. Matthews, Sonia? Yeah, just got back. He's clean. Been in bed for five days with a broken ankle. Broke it playing touch football with a neighborhood kid. Did you meet his wife? Uh-huh. Both of them real nice people. I'm sure upset. Wife seems to think an awful lot of Mrs. Matthews. Uh, when did he last see his mother? Well, Sunday afternoon, both Mr. and Mrs. Matthews dropped by to see him. Talked to his mother Monday morning on the phone. She was going downtown. Miss Murray was taking it. Mm-hmm. Mrs. Matthews said she had something to talk to him about. We'll see him later in the week. He have any idea what it was? No. She said she'd rather not talk about it over the phone, but he could wait. I'll get it, Ben. Remember the guy's name yet, Ben? What guy? Uh, the one that ran the wrong way for California in the Rose Bowl. Oh, no. no. Sure no. beats me. I've been trying to think of it since yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Guess that does it. That was Asher. A woman was just found a canyon about two miles from Matthew's house that answers his wife's description. They're bringing her in now. She's been murdered. <laughs> Brought her in. Doc wants another look on you, too. That coming right in? Yeah. Coin went out to get him. Should be here any minute. I sure don't envy you guys at a time like this. Uh, somebody's got to do it. Yeah, I suppose. Funny what you wind up doing. I was going to be a fireman. That then? Yeah. Hello, Mr. Matthews. Hello, Mr. Sergeant Klein told you. Hi. You okay? Yes, I'm all right. I just I can't believe it. You must be so mistaken. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. Ed. Oh, no. No. All right, Ed. I've got to call Charles. I'm sorry, Mr. Matthews. The sergeant quiet will go home. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm done it. I sure wish I'd have been fireman. <laughs> Hi, Frank. Hello, Glenn. Pete. Hi. Anybody been around? Just the usual. Reporters and so forth. Uh-huh. Was the weapon found with the body? Up there. Looked everywhere around here. Where was the body? Well, right over there, about three feet this side of that culvert. Looks like she might have been shot up there on the road and fell down here. Somebody stopped the car right up there. They could look both ways because of the turn of the road. Well, who found her? Ran up the road about a mile. Mr. Reynolds. Well, I got his address. I thought you might want to talk to him. Uh, 17436 Valley View Drive. Uh-huh. He was out exercising his dogs. Got a couple of great Danes. He usually doesn't come up this way, but he'd been out of town for a week and he wanted to give his dogs a good run. Uh, well, where does this road go? That ends up there about a quarter of a mile. Now, this whole area was subdivided about two years ago. Outfit went broke or something. Reynolds Place is the only house in Valley View after you leave Plymouth Boulevard down there. Any tire marks on the road? Well, lots of them. This is quite a spot for neckers. Uh, Doc said the body'd been here about two and a half days. There'd been a lot of cars up here in that time. Mm-hmm. Anybody coming out to relieve you? No. Jim told me to stick around and you got here. I don't think you'll find anything to help. I gave the place a good going over. No gun, no nothing. Just the body. Well, you might as well go on in then. Pete and I'll take a look around. Okay, Doc. Cigarette, then? No, thanks. Fancy. Oh, tips. Yeah, I thought I'd try them for a change. I lit the wrong end the other day. <laughs> Enough to make you quit smoking. <laughs> I can imagine. Hmm? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, nothing. Can't find the gun. 
You have a set of the bullets. You find the gun will be a loser. I thought it would be. No chance of it being suicide. Mm-hmm. None. Now, what about personal effects? Uh, Miss Page. Nothing but what she was wearing. Clothing, wristwatch, wedding ring, no clothes. Sorry, I'm not myself then. Well, you know what happened about no Monday. Weapon was a Luger. Luger's missing from the Matthews house. Only three, possibly four people could have known where the gun was. It wasn't stolen by a common house thief. Nothing else was missing. Charles, the son, is in the clear. Mr. Matthews is, too. Salesman is clean. May I use your phone, Doc? Sure. Ben, you busy? No. Good. I'll meet you in my office in ten minutes. Eight. Go out and pick up this Murray. You get a stenographer? Yeah, I put him up my desk. Good. He'll be able to hear okay over the intercom. Now, you stay out there. Pete will stay here in the office. Come in. Miss Murray, Lieutenant. Ah, hello, Miss Murray. Sorry to bother you. Uh, right here, Quine. Okay, Quine. I know this will be dull and repetitious for you, Miss Murray, but we'd like to go over everything you've told us. Anything you may have left out, no matter how trivial you may think it is, please tell me. Well, I don't know how I can possibly be of any help to you. I've already told you all I know. Uh, do you know Charles, Mr. and Mrs. Matthews' son? I should say I do. He's spoiled rotten. Mrs. gave him everything under the sun. Did he come over to their house, Miss? Oh, a couple of times a week, I guess. He hadn't been over for nearly a week, broke his ankle. Uh, did Charles uh, get along with his mother? I suppose so. Certainly should, all she did for him. They never had any words, then? Not that I know of, but anybody that had everything given to him like he has, I wouldn't trust very far. Now, how about uh, Mr. and Mrs. Matthews? Uh, you mean them getting along? That's right. Well, they seem to get along all right. Well, when you're working for somebody, you never know. Could have been putting up a front. You have a lot of company? Mrs. did. She's always having her club, meet at their house for a canasta party, luncheon, or something. She's always busy with something social. Mm. Uh, what happened Monday morning? My goodness. Do we have to go over that again? I've told you several times. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, frankly, Miss Murray, you're stumped. We're trying to uncover any possible lead. Anything at all that happened, no matter what, might in some way help us. Well, all right. I take the bus over there, Hal. I'm there three days a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Mm-hmm. I got there Monday morning, about 8.30. Mr. Matthews had left for work by the time I got there. He usually don't leave until about 9. But the missus said he had to go over to Longview to see about a contract he had over there, and he left early. Now, they may have had a fight before I got there, and that's why I left early. I don't know. Uh, did uh, Mrs. Matthews say anything to indicate there'd been any trouble between them that morning? No. Well, she wouldn't have told me. If there had been, she never discussed private matters with me. Now, about quarter to nine, there was a phone call from Charles. They talked about ten minutes, and the missus was on her way upstairs when the front doorbell rang. Mm-hmm. She hollered to me in the kitchen and told me she'd answer it. I don't know who it was at the door. Probably a salesman. And she didn't talk long at the door because shortly after I heard her go on upstairs. When did she tell you she wanted to go downtown? Oh, no, I forgot. Just as soon as I got there. She wanted to go and buy Charles and his wife an anniversary present. She was planning on coming home with Mr. Matthews. And I was to have dinner ready about 6.30. Uh, what time did you leave the house? Well, it must have been around 9.30. Uh, what what route did you take downtown? Well, we went straight down Pacific Boulevard. Uh-huh. You didn't take a shortcut over Valley View Drive? No, no, that's a dead end. How do you know? Well, I tried it once. When? What difference does it make? I just wondered. I know when it was. When I first went to work for them, I had my own car then, and I tried to go home one night that way. Uh, how long have you worked for the Matthew? Four years. Nearly five. Do you know if they kept a gun in the house? No, I don't know. I suppose they did. Most every man has a gun of some kind around. Anything happen on the way downtown? Nothing. 
What did you do after you left Mrs. Matthews? I went on back to their house. I had a lot of work to do. What kind of a car did you own, Miss Murray? No, it was an old thing. 1937 Ford. What on earth is that to do with what happened? Do you have a driver's license? Well, of course I do. Could I see it, please? I suppose so. What are you trying to do? You think I did something to Mrs. Matthews? Here. Thank you. Did you have a license to drive your car? Of course. That's a renewal license you have there. I know. Uh, This shows your original license was issued in 1949. That's only three years ago. What year did you say you sold your car? I didn't say. What possible good can all this do? This whole thing has upset me so... Did you think for one minute that I had anything to... I'm not accusing you of anything. We only want your help. Well, I don't know what more help I can be. I've gone over this so much... I don't know what I'm saying anymore. You say you tried to take a shortcut over Valley View Drive when you first went to work for the man? Yes, I just told you that. That was nearly five years ago. Of course. Five years ago, there wasn't any subdivision in that area. There wasn't any such place as Valley View Drive. <laughs> You've always given place to Charles. All right. I took a bracelet that was hers. Oh, she never come right out and told me she knew. She just hint at it, make remarks. I heard her talking to Charles about something she wanted to tell him. I knew what it was. So I found a gun in the desk drawer that morning while she was upstairs. When we were down on Plymouth, I made her turn up that road. I tried to scare her. She just laughed at me. I didn't mean to kill her. She guns in my apartment. She said, <laughs> Okay, Quine. <laughs> You got it? Okay. Walker. Roy Riggles. What? The guy that ran the wrong way in the Rose Bowl. Roy Riggles, that's his name. Oh, yeah. Lineup, or before you pass the innocent, the vagrant, the thief, the murderer. Listen again on Friday, December 12th, when we again bring you The Lineup. May I have your attention, please? You people out there on the other side of the wire, if you want to use room, may I have your attention, please? Thank you. My name is Carter, Sergeant Pete Carter. I'll explain the lineup to you. Each of the suspects you will see will be numbered. I'll call up a number, their name, and charge. Have any questions or identification? Please remember the number assigned to the prisoner as I call his name. Lineup, starring Bill Johnstone as Lieutenant Ben Guthrie, with Jack Moyle as Sergeant Pete Carger, was written by David M. Light, with music composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. Featured in tonight's cast were High Everback, Virginia Gregg, Sam Edwards, Clayton Post, Harry Lang, Jerry Hausner, and Howard McNear. The lineup is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. will not be heard next week, but returns to the air on a new day and at a new time. Beginning December 12th, the lineup will be heard on Fridays at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time over most of these same CBS radio stations. Remember, the lineup and yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be heard on Fridays.
Dan Coverly speaking. And remember, you meet comedy when you meet Millie, starring Audrey Totter, Thursday nights on the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Uh, it is definitely uh, somewhat foolish to make uh, an excuse based on roads when you are in a growing area, uh, particularly like we're assuming uh, wherever the lineup was in the nineteen um, in the nineteen fifties. Uh, same thing out here. Um, we have a suburb outside of Boise called Meridian, and streets change very frequently. I was kind of wondering whether they were holding back the answer to who did the um, uh, f- the football uh, thing, and I kept wondering uh, whether they were just not telling who it was in order to avoid uh, reminding a nation of a, a goat or to avoid hurting someone's feelings, but it turned out they were saving that for the end. Um, I know that it's a good idea to end a mystery by revealing a solution, but uh, this didn't, didn't seem quite right a right note to end on. But anyway, wasn't a bad episode. Let's go ahead and get into uh, listener comments and feedback, and we have an iTunes review. And this review uh, is from Google Girl, who says, I've been a lifelong fan of all things old-time radio. And when I found Adam's podcast, I was pretty excited. At first, I fast-forwarded through Adam's commentary. But now, after listening to him for over a year, I love the commentary. Adam often shares things about my favorite shows that I've never heard before. Good job, Adam. Keep it up. Well, thanks so much. I do appreciate it. And that's all. The one thing I want to remind listeners, be sure and send me a show that we haven't played and is not due to be played soon. And we'll consider playing it during the listener support campaign. We'll play a total of three. And uh, you can take a look look at the list of shows we intend to play in the future at biglist.greatdetectives.net. Well, that will do it for now. Uh, If you have a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.